Hello. Uh, this will be the first video lecture in our series for our course on development and social change. Uh, this video lecture, I'll be talking about the very important sociological theorist Karl Marx and his ideas about colonization and development and what came to be known as globalization. Uh, I'll be talking about the Communist Manifesto that he and Friedrich Engels wrote in 1848, and then uh, some of Marx's own writings uh, pertaining to uh, India and China and Ireland. So I'm going to go to the screen share mode to pull up our PowerPoint. And I suppose the first thing that we can say here is that um, Marx never had a, a, a sort of full blown theory of colonialism or imperialism. Um, in the same way that he, you know, would develop a full-blown theory of, of capitalism. However, in, uh, especially in the first part of the Communist Manifesto, which I'm going to walk you through here in this lecture, Marx and Engels did write a lot about how capitalism always seeks to expand geographically, sp spatially. Um, how it's always looking to expand around the world and thereby anticipates what would later be called globalization, um, this sort of global international expansion of capitalism. Uh, we'll talk about like how Marx identifies in the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels identify uh, the dynamics of capitalism as being one of the compression of space and time, um, that they sort of, uh, capitalism works to expand its geographic reach uh, in a way that compresses spatial differences, you know, basically makes the, the world smaller, and at the same time accelerates the tempo of social change um, that, you know, accelerates uh, time. So uh, we'll be drawing on uh, a geographer by the name of uh, Harvey, who's going to be very important for this course in talking about capitalism as a, as a dynamic of the compression of space and time. And then we'll turn towards looking to, uh, at Marx's, some of Marx's later writings about uh, the histories and, and consequences of colonization in in India and China and Ireland, uh, which he wrote in the you know 1850s, 1860s, uh, around that period of time. So the first thing to sort of say about Marx's overall analysis is that he was obviously very critical of colonialism and, and capitalist development. I mean, this is this is probably the, the world's greatest critic of capitalism still to this day. Um, but it's important to note that he did not completely just simply reject uh, these dynamics out of hand. Um, but instead, his, his attitudes were, you know, what we would call dialectical, uh, characterized by a deep kind of ambivalence. And this ambivalence arose because Marx recognized that, you know, yes, development, capitalist development was, was destructive and, and caused mass suffering. But he also felt that, uh, like somewhat ironically, that it also created new opportunities for humanity to advance to higher stages of freedom and equality. In other words, in Marx's vision, um, the advance from feudalism to capitalism was a kind of a, a precursor, a kind of a, a stepping stone that unwittingly laid the groundwork for socialism and communism. 
not because the capitalists themselves wanted that, but because of its inherent internal contradictions. And Mar Marx's dialectical viewpoint of history is basically that progress uh, and change comes out of these in internal contradictions within a social system. And that's very much at play here. We look, uh, especially at the first part of the Communist Manifesto. The ironic thing about the first part of the Communist Manifesto is that it's really all about capitalism. And it's, it's one of the most sort of trenchant criticisms that, that Marx offered, you know, uh, Marx and Engels offered within the span of, of just a few pages. So to kind of walk you through, you know, the first part uh, of this communist manifesto, it, it begins with this very bold claim that the history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggle, you know, and, and often there's a, there's a footnote attached to this that says, you know, well, at least, um, the history of, of, of uh, societies within the, the scope of, of written civilization, you know, uh, because in, in sort of pre-literate civilizations, we can, you know, at least anthropologically piece together that there was more, um, you know, more of a sense of equality. Um, but when we get to the stage of, you know, what's called civilization, it's, you know, coterminous with, the development of class society. And so in the next couple of graphs, he talks a lot about all the different forms that this class struggle and these class inequalities have taken in different societies over history. Um, and uh, basically that that is kind of leading up to um, the development of a capitalist society in which the class struggle becomes one of the bourgeoisie uh, or the, the capitalist class against the proletariat, uh, the working class. So a lot of this first part of the Communist Manifesto is describing how capitalism is uh, replacing, is supplanting feudalism across Europe uh, in, their, in their lifetimes. And another important thing that they say, you know, within the, the, the first page or so of this uh, part one is that the, the discovery, the so-called discovery of the Americas, you know, with Christopher Columbus and all this sort of thing in, in 1492 was it was a crucial step in this transformation in, the, in this historical development of capitalism, that it, uh, in their words, opened up fresh ground for the rising bourgeoisie. And then in turn, that this system of capitalism uh, seeks to extend across space, to expand, extend its, its tentacles geographically, such that modern industry has established the world market. Um, what follows in the next you know, handful of paragraphs or so is, is basically a short history of the long process in which the bourgeoisie came to power as a ruling class uh, over you know a period of, of several centuries but Marx and Engels are, are really you know writing at a, a, a fast pace here they're describing it how the modern bourgeoisie is itself the product of a long course of development of a series of revolutions in the modes of production and of exchange the uh, again, the, the, the sort of dialectical vision here is how new societies emerge from contradictions of the old and how the bourgeoisie was born, in this case, from the womb of feudalism. They talk about the growth of markets and industry, the expansion of communication, uh, the expansion of, of transportation and navigation, you know, all of these dynamics kind of grew up within the womb of feudalist society and then were you know to continue to carry the metaphor were given birth into uh, what we know as capitalism 
and then you know they kind of describe how then the bourgeoisie became the ruling class by capturing state power how it became politically dominant as a ruling class with this great sentence uh, the executive of the modern state is but a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie that basically the state the government is not a you know a neutral referee or umpire it's not you know sort of a, a, an objective uh, thing standing independently of class society but in fact is actually its its function is to help to maintain and manage the common affairs of the capitalist class uh, i think we we see that more so today than uh, in 1848, that has become more and more true. Um, the next thing they do is, is basically to describe, you know, the, the differences between capitalism and feudalism and, and kind of what makes, uh, you know, capitalism unique and uh, makes the bourgeoisie unique as a, as a ruling class. And they're talking here about how the bourgeoisie makes everything and everyone into into money uh transforms everything into in their phrase callous cash exchange how they reduce relationships between people to naked self-interest and callous cash payment which is kind of why i used this slide of the nirvana album never mind with you know the, the this image of you know the the innocent baby being lured in by a dollar on a fish hook, you know, like the, the way in which uh, in their vision, uh, the bourgeoisie basically, you know, and, and capitalism as a, as a social dynamic uh, profanes and corrupts all that is uh, sacred and innocent into this uh system uh, that centers around money and and you know callous cash exchange they talk about how the bourgeoisie converts all that was once considered sacred into something profane um or you know to you know to continue with kind of the musical comparisons as as bob dylan had once saying you know, money doesn't talk, it swears. I think that's from the, the song, um, Don't Think Twice, It's All Right. And uh, so, you know, they continue on with this idea that, you know, uh, the bourgeoisie has, has, has converted the, the physician, the lawyer, the priest, the poet, the man of science into its paid wage laborers. It's, it's reduced everything and everyone down to this lowest common denominator of money and uh thereby even the, the family you know the sort of the most sacred institution of any society has been reduced in their words to a mere money relation so there's a kind of like nihilism at the heart of capitalism you know where everything becomes reduced down to this, this fundamental plane of, of um, money. However, they also recognize, uh, Marx and Engels do, the innovative and productive capacities of capitalist development. And in comparing it again with feudalism, they recognize it's difference from what they call the slothful indolence of feudalism, basically the laziness of the aristocracy under feudalism, you know, where nothing much had really changed for hundreds of years. Um, whereas capitalism, as destructive and uh, as nihilistic as it is, uh, capitalism is they say enormously productive and innovative um hence the kind of dialectical ambivalence that is to say that capitalism is a is a force of creative destruction 
um, something that both creates and dis destroys at once. Uh, certainly destroys communities, destroys nature, destroys people's lives, um, but is also indisputably the most innovative and productive system, uh, economic system in the history of the world. Um, that it accelerates the tempo of social change, you know, of technological innovation, you know, creates huge cities, creates new forms of uh, communications technologies, new kinds of transportation, and thereby compresses spatial distance, you know, compresses the amount of time that it gets, that it takes, you know, to get from point A to point B or to communicate from point A to point B. And so they say in this, you know, this very kind of um, poetic kind of sentence, like, you know, that, that the, it, the, the bourgeoisie has been the first to show what man's activity can bring about. It has accomplished wonders far surpassing Egyptian pyramids, Roman aqueducts, and Gothic cathedrals. It has conducted expeditions that put in the shade all former exoduses of nations and crusades. So they're going, you know, kind of rewinding through the whole history of the world and all of these accomplishments, you know, these like seven wonders of the world and so forth, you know, all of these historic developments and saying capitalism, you know, in a very short amount of time has dwarfed all of these in terms of its production and innovation and technological development. And so development is seen as a fundamental necessity of capitalism, you know, where the only constant is change itself. So they have this great passage here where they say the bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production and thereby the relations of production and with them the whole relations of society. Constant revolutionizing of production, uninterrupted disturbance of all social conditions, everlasting uncertainty and agitation distinguish the bourgeois epoch from all earlier ones. All fixed fast frozen relations with their train of ancient and venerable prejudices and opinions are swept away. All new formed ones become antiquated before they can ossify. All that is solid melts into the air. All that is holy is profaned. And man is at last compelled to face with sober senses his real conditions of life and his relations with his kind. This is a big passage, but Notice where it begins with the idea that the bourgeoisie must constantly revolutionize the instruments of production. It must, it must constantly revolutionize technology, instruments of communication, instruments of media, you know, all of, you know, it must revolutionize cities, all of these instruments of production. And as it does that, it revolutionizes the relations between people, the relations of society. And so that's why this idea that the only constant is change itself, you know, this constant revolutionizing, this uninterrupted disturbance, this everlasting uncertainty, all of these things are the things that distinguish capitalism, the bourgeois epoch from all of the previous ruling classes and all of the previous economic systems that came before. And with that, they imagine that it changes the whole sphere of society and social relations. It, our values change, our ideas change, our cultures change. All these things that we thought were fixed, you know, all of these ancient and veg uh, venerable prejudice and, uh, prejudices and opinions, you know, all of these things that were 
thought to be solid uh, are swept away. And uh, even the ones that, you know, that uh, they, they become antiquated before they can ossify, they, they become antiquated before they can even become solid, before they can congeal. And so this, this last sentence is a thing, you know, I kind of like, you know, walking around San Francisco, for example, and, you know, kind of muttering to myself all the time, all that is solid melts into air, all that is holy is profaned. You know, things are being created and destroyed at the same time. Communities, people, nature, instruments of production, instruments of communications, social relationships, all of it is subject to this dialectic of creative destruction. So, well, what we have here is a system that must revolutionize, it must grow, it must develop, it must expand. They didn't use this term globalization in 1848. I mean, no one, no one did. But the thing that's so remarkable about this first part of the manifesto is that they anticipated its development. They anticipated that Globalization was kind of built into the logic of capitalism itself, that capitalism must constantly seek to expand its geographic reach. It must constantly ex seek to expand spatially. And at the root of this is the need for a constantly expanding market for its products. This is the thing that chases the bourgeoisie over the whole surface of, its, uh, of the globe. It has to sell more commodities to more people in a larger, uh, you know, in, in more parts of the world. It has to look for new, uh, cheaper forms of labor. It has to look for new, uh, you know, natural resources. No, it must constantly be looking to expand its markets and thereby it must nestle everywhere, it must settle everywhere, must establish connections everywhere. And so the ultimate end logic of this is going to be a system that is increasingly interconnected around the world, an economic system that you know, has no national boundaries. You know, a system that is globally interconnected. In the process, one of the things that it, you know, destroys is uh, local cultures. You know, capitalism uh, in the process of globalizing, <clears throat> of spreading its markets around the world, of spreading, you know, its, its fast food and popular culture and celebrities and technology and, and all these things as they become more and more globalized it has the effect of you know destroying local cultures all over the world and so they write the bourgeoisie has through its exploitation of the world market given a cosmopolitan character to production and consumption in every country all old established national industries have been destroyed or are daily being destroyed. They are dislodged by new industries whose introduction becomes a life and death question for all civilized nations by industries that no longer work up indigenous raw material, but raw material drawn from the remotest zones. Industries whose products are consumed not only at home, but in every quarter of the globe, right? So um, these uh, commodities are being, you know, forced upon people around the world, as it says here, as, as, as a kind of a life and death question, and not something that really people around the world have a choice in the matter of capital, you know, kind of invades and penetrates these cultures and, and people's lives uh, all over the world. And um, then we get 
you know, these industries that no longer, you know, work up uh, indigenous raw materials, like no longer like homegrown kind of um, raw materials, but instead the raw materials come from, you know, all these remote zones around the world and uh, industries are, you know, the, the commodities that they produce, their products are consumed not only at home, but in every quarter of the globe. Again, anticipating the kind of thing that you know we see now with you know the globalization of everything from you know mcdonald's to the iphone to you know like taylor swift like everything being uh you know uh, consumed um by people around the world Likewise, with a global exchange of culture, taste, literature, and so forth, they say, in place of the old wants satisfied by the production of the country, we find new wants requiring for their satisfaction the products of distant lands and uh, climes. In place of the old local and national seclusion and so production. The intellectual creations of individual nations become common property. National one-sidedness and narrow-mindedness become more and more impossible, and from the numerous national and local literatures, there arises a world literature. So they're talking here about, you know, literature in the end, but we could very much easily apply this to all kinds of different kinds of culture, art, food, entertainment, sports, you know, you name it, um, we find this kind of uh, making of a, of, a, of a global culture. Um, and an essential part of this, of course, is technology, uh, and specifically communications technologies. Um, what, you know, in our time is, you know, the media and like social media and um, forms of, you know, all kinds of forms of communication that basically allow us to know what's going on around the world, you know, at the, at the, at the click of a button. Um, in their time, you know, of course, these were much less sophisticated, um, but they could still see that the, the logic, the dynamic of this system was to globalize. So the bourgeoisie, by the rapid improvement of all instruments of production, by the immensely facilitated means of communication, draws all, even the most barbarian nations, into civilization. The cheap prices of commodities are the heavy artillery with which it batters down all Chinese walls, with which it forces the barbarians instant intensely obstinate hatred of foreigners to capitulate it compels all nations on pain of extinction to adopt the bourgeois mode of production it compels them to introduce what it calls civilization into their midst i.e to become bourgeois themselves in one word it creates a world after its own image a so again, these communications technologies that are obviously so important in our time in terms of creating a kind of global network of information and entertainment and culture, um, Marx and Engels identified that this would be the logical end result of this system that must expand, must develop, must innovate, must create new markets, must reach more people. And that, you know, again, this, this is something that, that cultures around the world have to kind of adopt and, and adapt into um, on pain of extinction, you know, as they say, <laughs> like basically like you have to adapt and adopt these technologies or die. You know, 
Um, the one thing that cannot be maintained are these traditional local cultures. Uh, they are always at risk of becoming extinct in the face of these spreading technologies and forms of, of media. Um, likewise, another key part of the creative, destructive, uh, creative destruction that lies at the heart of capitalism is the creation of cities and, and urbanization. Marx and Engels describe how capitalism creates these massive cities and spurs uh, urban migration, causes people to move from the countryside into these big cities, um, you know, mainly in, in search of work, but also because they're, you know, losing their access to land. And so it says, uh, they say it has created, the bourgeoisie has created enormous cities, has greatly increased the urban population as compared with the rural and has thus rescued a considerable part of the population from the idiocy of rural life. And this is something we see in every society that adopts capitalist mode of production on pain of extinction is that there is this transformation in the population in the demography of, of the society in so far as you see a migration from the countryside of people uh, and people migrating from the countryside into the cities. And then this relationship between the countryside and the city, between the, the city and, and town, or you know, between the urban and the rural becomes a relationship of uh, dependence um, that they compare, you know, is, is analogous to the uh, dependence that the more peripheral, uh, poorer nations have on uh, the richer poor nations, the, the so-called the, the metropole. Um, that's a dynamic that we'll be talking about when we look at world systems theory um, in a few weeks. Um, an another aspect of this creative destruction that lies at the heart of capitalist development is the relationship to nature and, and the domination uh, and destruction of nature, but also the the transformation of nature in uh, in a way that facilitates production and, and development. And so much of capitalism's productivity comes from this technological mastery over nature, uh, in which they write the bourgeoisie during its scarce rule, uh, the, its rule of scarce 100 years has created more massive and more colossal productive forces than all preceding generations together. This is something you know we've already talked about. This is that this uh, incredible, dynamic, innovative, productive um, uh, results of of capitalism. Subjection of nature's forces to man, machinery, application of chemistry to industry and agriculture, steam navigation, railways, electric telegraphs clearing of whole continents for cultivation, canalization of rivers, whole populations conjured out of the ground. What earlier century had even a presentiment that such productive forces slumbered in the lap of social labor? Right, so they're talking about like how, you know, like compared to all the ruling classes and all the economic systems that came before it, Capitalism is indisputably the most productive, dynamic, innovative, you know, technologically, um, you know, accelerating. All of these systems uh, put into place this 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 inherent kind of dynamic um, that is again both creative and destructive at the same time, it, and um they are as as you can see it, it, to some extent almost like in awe, awe 
of what they have seen from the industrial revolution and what they have seen, you know, as far as this um, mastery over nature, this uh, transformation. Uh, and if you look at the technological innovations that they list here, steam navigation, railways, electric telegraphs, this is all about like the compression of spatial distance, you know, like cutting down the amount of time and the amount of effort that it takes to get from point A to point B, like making the world smaller. Um, and also, you know, accelerating the tempo of social change. So this compression of, of space and time being um, a, a major effect of uh, capitalism's uh, dynamic. The thing is <laughs> that capitalism is also extraordinarily destructive. And they include in this the idea that capitalism is also very self-destructive. Um, it is dynamic, it is innovative, and it is productive, but it is also totally unstable. Um, and in their, from their perspective, like ultimately unsustainable. Like it's just completely like um, prone to crisis. You know, one of them, the only predictable things about capitalism is that there will eventually be a crisis you know, a recession, a depression, some sort of financial implosion. The history of capitalism is littered with these events from, you know, the depression of 1873 to the Great Depression of the 1930s to, you know, the financial meltdown that we saw in 2008 uh, here uh, in this LA Times newspaper, the, the stock market crash of 1987. The most predictable thing about capitalism is eventually there's going to be a crisis because it is a system that is inherently um, unsustainable and un, um, it, it, it just it completely destroys its own foundations, it is crisis prone. And I, they have this way of putting it that's that's basically taken from um, Goethe's uh, Faust, um, the the story of Faust, which is the, basically the story of you know like the the deal with the devil. Um, they talk about uh, how modern bourgeois society, with its relations of production, of exchange, and of property, a society that has conjured up such gigantic means of production and of exchange is like the sorcerer who is no longer able to control the powers of the netherworld whom he has called up by its spells. <laughs> they are like this, this uh, capitalists are basically conjuring up these forces that quickly escape their own control. They are creating and putting out into the world uh, these forces that will come back to haunt them and destroy them. You know, there's almost like this kind of Frankenstein kind of dynamic in which like the creator creates this thing that ultimately comes back to destroy it. So capitalism is, is an inherently destructive system, not only in the sense that it destroys nature and community and culture and people's lives, it also creates the foundation of its own self-destruction. And the force that is going to carry out that, you know, self-destruction, we'll talk about in a minute, is, is, is the proletariat, is, is the working class. At the root of this crisis is uh, what Marx and Engels call overproduction. Um, and they elaborate uh, more on this in um, Marx, especially talks about the crisis of overproduction as being 
endemic as, as being inherent to capitalism in, in some of his more elaborate economic writings. Um, they talk about this maybe for about a paragraph in the, in the Kant's manifesto. It's not especially well-developed. Um, but again, like the, the, there's this idea um, that the system is inherently crisis prone. And in an attempt to solve that crisis, or at least to address that crisis, one of the things that capitalism is always trying to do is to expand its global markets, basically to sell all this overproduced stuff um, to more and more and more people. And yet this is a kind of a, a spatial fix. This, this attempt to, to expand its geographic reach is only temporary it's 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 like a, it's a fix in the same way that like addiction fix like it temporarily resolves the need but then it kind of digs uh, a deeper hole you know that they they can never kind of get out of there's just a series of temporary spatial fixes that just uh but but ultimately it, it doesn't like resolve the issue it, it in fact actually deepens the crisis more and more and more. And so they write, and how does the bourgeoisie get over these crises? On the one hand, by enforced destruction of the mass of productive forces. On the other, by the conquest of new markets and uh, by the more thorough exploitation of the old ones. That is to say, by paving the way for more extensive and more destructive crises, and by diminishing the means whereby crises are prevented. Um, this is something that we will talk about uh, more in the next video lecture when uh, we look at Marxist theories of imperialism during the 20th century that sought to understand uh, imperialism as a, as a response to um, this need to expand markets um, and uh, this, uh, you know, a, a response to a, a greater like instability, an inherent instability that is at the root of the capitalist system. So capitalism uh, unwittingly plants the seeds of its own destruction uh, in creating a proletariat, the working class. And these are the people that Marx believes, uh, Marx and Engels believe, will eventually rise up to overthrow the bourgeoisie and institute the next process of social change. So just in the same way that feudalism, you know, created the conditions for its own destruction, as they talked about in the beginning of part one of the manifesto, Marx and Engels are suggesting that capitalism will also create the same, you know, conditions and contradictions out of which a revolution will occur that will give birth to a new and higher stage of society. Again, this is Marx's dialectical view of history. Um, a good shorthand of way of thinking about it, uh, as Marx later says, you know, that everything is pregnant with its contrary. You know, so everything, every system has within it um, the seeds of its own destruction, the thing that will eventually cause it to self-destruct and move on to something uh, higher and better. And so they say not only, but not only has the bourgeoisie forged the weapons that bring death to itself, it has also caused, called into existence the men who are to wield those weapons, the modern working class, the proletarians. Now, why is that? Um, Marx and Engels describe the proletariat define working class under capitalism, basically, as those who live only so long as they find work and who find work 
only so long as their labor increases capital. It's, so the working class uh, are people that have lost their access to land and other means of production that allowed past generations to survive. The only thing that they have to sell to basically keep themselves alive uh, is their labor, their ability to work, their labor power. And so as workers, we basically, we live only so, you know, we, we live only in so far as we're able to get a job and we're only able to get a job in so far as our labor increases capital. And so we're only able to get a job and find work if we're able to make money for, you know, the boss. Um, if there isn't, you know, if we're not creating what Marx called surplus value, if we're not creating more value than what we're being paid for, then like the employer, then we, we are worthless to our em employers. And, you know, we're not going to have a job for long. So we only find work insofar as our labor creates more value than what we're getting paid in the form of a wage by our employer, creates more value for, for the employer for capital. Under these conditions for the proletariat, Marx and Engels say work loses all, loses all its individual character and uh, workers are basically reduced to being an appendage of the machine, right? That we become like, you know, the, the arm or the leg of the, you know, the computer or the assembly line or the phone, this whole like relationship between technology and people, between technology and workers is flipped on its head so that instead of the machine being our tool to use, it's like we as workers, as human beings, become a tool of the machine. We become like an appendage of the machine. And we are thereby dehumanized, you know, robbed of our humanity. Uh, our work loses its individual character. I think the, the picture that's used in this slide uh, tells a very, you know, germ paints a very dramatic portrait of that process you know, as it happens on assembly lines and offices um, all over uh, workplaces all over the world. And so this, this cruel irony is, is that, you know, the workers are the ones who create wealth, create the value of capitalism. The workers are the ones who are at the, the heart of this you know, process this dynamic, uh, productive, innovative system, and yet, despite the wealth that they create and the value they create, workers are continually struggling to survive under cap capitalism. So it's this system in which the working class is creating this enormous amounts of wealth uh, around the world. And yet they themselves uh, are struggling just to get by. I think that is most certainly the case today, um, even more so perhaps than in 1848, when Marx and Engels wrote this. So they describe this whole process in which like, you know, like the different, like the, the what were like the middle classes, you know, the like the craftsman and the small business owner and, you know, the, the handicraft workers and, you know, all these, you know, formerly like specialized, like kind of independent workers are kind of forced down into the ranks of the proletariat. 
you know, the, the way that the, the people in Occupy Wall Street would have put it was, you know, society becomes more and more polarized between the 1% and the 99%. That 1% who own and control uh, so much of the wealth around the world and then the 99% of us who have to work for that 1%. Um, and, uh, you know, we create their wealth and yet struggle to get by. Society becomes increasingly polarized between these two classes. That was kind of the point that they started part one with was to say, that capitalism is is one in which increasingly uh, is polarized into the two hostile camps between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat and the middle class, you know, continues to erode and dissolve. Um, it's one of those things that uh, melts into air. The irony of the whole situation is, is that Marx and Engels believe that this working class that is so exploited will be the thing that ultimately rises up to destroy capitalism. And the irony is, is that capitalism will create the very conditions that allow that proletariat, that working class, to rise up and just destroy capitalism. They will do this unwittingly, you know, like unintentionally, um, but they will do it by, first of all, creating these enormous cities in which the proletariat is congregated, you know, living in these dense neighborhoods, working in these huge factories, you know, it will congregate thousands and, and millions of exploited people together uh, into these cities. Uh, and it will also create these means of communication, you know, these ways of people connecting and networking that will allow them to uh, mobilize and unionize and struggle together. So, you know, they, Contrast this with like in, in past historical eras, you know, the, the exploited people, uh, the, the lower classes were more kind of scattered. They were more spread out around the countryside, like the peasantry, you know, would be, you know, spread out in, uh, into all these little villages in the rural countryside. But now capitalism comes along and basically concentrates all these people together uh, and allows them, you know, gives them the means to communicate and thereby to organize and get together and to, to find a kind of social collective power in which they can fight back and eventually overthrow this system that is exploiting them. Globalization, you know, th this, this process we've been talking about um, allows workers to do this not only on a national level, but on an international level, you know, so that now like workers. Um, at the end of the whole manifesto, which is, you know, workers of the world unite. You know, it's not workers of England or workers of Russia or workers of France or whatever. Um, it's workers of the world. You know, they have, they, ultimately, it's, it's an international vision that they have. And so they conclude part one with this, uh, this very powerful image that what the bourgeoisie therefore produces above all are its own grave diggers. So it is a a system of creative destruction that ultimately creates the force that will destroy it. Um, its fall and the victory of the proletariat are equally inevitable. So, 
Um, this kind of outlines, I think, Marx and Engels's view of uh, their sort of dialectical and 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 you know somewhat ambivalent view of the process of development um, as it applies to the global expansion of capitalism. Um, when we look at their writings on colonization and colonialism, we find a similar kind of dialectical ambivalence. Um, as far as India, Marx wrote uh, actually quite extensively um, about Indian society. And he's very interested in India and, and read a lot about its history and um, was basically hired uh, by an American newspaper, the New York Tribune, um, during the 1850s to write as a as a European correspondent, you know, to like as a foreign affairs kind of reporter. And one of the topics that he very frequently wrote about was was India and and its colonization by by the British. Um, many of these writings, especially the earlier ones from, you know, the early 1850s have been criticized as being uh, Eurocentric um, and, you know, insofar as they, they kind of assumed that British colonization would be a force for uh, development and, and modernization in India. Um, the, the writer Edward Said uh, in his book, his famous book, Orientalism, was, was one of those who criticized Marx for this um, assumption that was very common in the 19th century, which was that, you know, colonization and, and development were, were progressive forces that, you know, were going to um, lead uh, these impoverished countries into a higher stage of uh, development and technological modernization and, and ultimately to, to progress. Um, those were like sort of built-in assumptions that were, that were very common in the 19th century, taken for granted, really. Um, and, and so we see a certain amount of that in the article that, that I've assigned uh, the Future Results of British Rule in India, which is one of these articles that was written for the New York Tribune in 1853. And, and it, it really exemplifies this kind of uh, ambivalence, you know, where Marx starts off by saying that, you know, India is a, you know, it's almost like this prehistoric place. It's this place that has no history at all and, and therefore could not escape the fate of being conquered. Um, and then he goes on to talk about how, you know, British colonialism brought, you know, railways and steam power and irrigation and free press and, and, and these, these kinds of communications uh, technologies, um, all of these, these foundations of in, industrial development. A, a lot of what he writes here, you know, is kind of seems like an echo of the writings from the Communist Manifesto from five years earlier. Um, you know, he's basically talking about these as uh, technological forms of, of development and innovation, um, emphasizing, you know, kind of the, the, the creative part of the creative destruction. Um, he also, in, in looking at the destructive part of it, you know, he seems to kind of welcome some of the changes that colonialism might bring as far as dissolving the old um, Indian caste system that was based on this kind of hereditary stratification in which people were born into certain castes um, within India. He says the bourgeoisie lays down the material premises for progress while also dragging individuals and peoples through blood and dirt through misery and degradation. See, so certainly recognizes the, the horrible and destructive and violent aspects of colonization in India, but he's also, you know, kind of hopeful 
that some of this will have the effect of dissolving this this you know terrible caste system in which people were you know basically born into these different um, strata, these different castes, and you know couldn't do anything about it. You were just kind of like if you were an untouchable you if you were born an untouchable you were an untouchable for the rest of your life. Um, so Marx, you know, recognizes that this is a, um, a nakedly destructive system of colonization. He doesn't, he doesn't flinch or sugarcoat uh, that. Uh, he talks about the profound hypocrisy and inherent barbarism of bourgeois civilization uh, as it lies unveiled before our eyes turning from its home where it assumes respectable forms to the colonies where it goes naked. This is, you know, part of the, the destructive aspects of colonization that is, is really laid bare in, in um, you know, the documentary Exterminate All the Brutes uh, in, in Raoul Peck's film in which we see uh, this profound hypocrisy and, and inherent barbarism. And Marx is kind of saying here that, you know, in, at home, like in Europe, in, in, you know, in England or France or, you know, in the United States or whatever, you know, it, it, it assumes a respectable form, exploitation does. But in the colonies, it's just totally naked. Like it's just shameless, direct, brutal violence. Um, and it's like the it's unveiled, like the mask is off when it comes to dealing with uh, these um, these colonies in Africa or Asia or Latin America. And these men who who call themselves the, the colonizers, who call themselves men of property and order and family and religion, you know, these high-minded kind of ideals. Um, when you look at what they do in the colonies, Marx says they have engaged in atrocious extortion and they trade in murder and prostitution. You know, this is where the profound hypocrisy is really unveiled, the profound hypocrisy of bourgeois civilization is most nakedly evident in uh, the colonies. So he doesn't shy away or is, is certainly aware <laughs> of this, you know, destructive aspect of, and violent aspect of colonization, but still he concludes that colonization and capitalist development are going to you know, lay the foundation ultimately for revolutionary change, that they will um, sow the seeds for something better. He says, bourgeois industry and commerce create these material conditions of a new world in the same way as geological revolutions have created the surface of the earth. Now, in his later writings on India, within just a few years, he became a lot more critical and a lot more skeptical about this idea that colonization could bring some kind of unintended progress. Um, he became increasingly anti-colonial, and, and we'll see this not only in his writings on India, but what he has to say about China and then us. Uh, what he has to say about Ireland. Um, as for Marx, the turning point is, is an uprising in 1857-1858 in which um, Indian soldiers uh, revolted and, and killed British officers. And this revolt, uh, the Sepoy uprising, spread across India um, as uh, you know the rebels seized uh, Delhi and, and other cities in India. Marx paid very close attention 
to this uprising, wrote something like 30 articles for the New York Tribune about it. And it caused him, it, it kind of changed his mind. It kind of changed some of his perspective. He became more and more critical um, and less, you know, ambivalent about the effects of colonization as he saw uh, the Indian people rising up and, and revolting against uh, British rule. Likewise, with some of his writings about China, um, Marx paid very much close attention to what was the, what were then called the Opium Wars. Um, the first opium, there was basically uh, historians talk about a first and a second opium war. And the, and the first opium war was basically triggered, um, you know, by the, the, the Chinese government prohibiting uh, the importing of opium, uh, you know, opium trafficking by, by British merchants. They're bringing in opium and, and opium was a very profitable commodity, the most profitable commodity uh, for, for British merchants at that time. Um, and yet, you know, was having devastating impacts uh, on the Chinese population in the same way that opiates continue to have devastating uh, effects on populations to this day. And the British government basically responded by saying, no, you can't do that. You can't prohibit, you know, this, this kind of trafficking. Uh, and they did this under the, the guise of free trade. You know, the British government insisted on these principles of free trade and that merchants had to be compensated if their opium got seized. And this kind of leads to this, this war, this first war. Um, out of that war, uh, Hong Kong became a, a British colony um, as part of the, the treaty to settle the first opium war in 1842. Um, and Marx also wrote about this, uh, this massive uprising called the, the Taiping Rebellion, um, which went uh, from 1850 to 1864. Uh, in, which ultimately claimed something like 20 million deaths um, from the repression, civil war, and famine. So again, as with India, this is a period of great upheaval and rebellion and uprising and a, um, a war you know, against a, a colonizing power in the, in the British um, that would kind of, you know, uh, affect or, or influence Marx's thinking as it, as it went on and as the, the death and destruction continued to accumulate. So his article that I've um, signed to you a revolution in China and in Europe is an article uh, also in the New York Tribune that he published in 1853 and basically it focuses on this uh, the effects of the opium trade and the effects of the Taiping rebellion so that's just you know kind of the context for um, what he's writing about here he begins that article by describing how trade had, had dragged China out of isolation into the world economy um, with a disruptive impact on its social order. So again, the, the kind of dynamic of creative destruction that's you know, analogous to the effects of colonization in, in India, where it brings China into the orbit of uh, global capitalism, you know, on pain of extinction, um, you know, like it, it, as he said in the Communist Manifesto, but it, nonetheless, it, it, it drags 
China into this world economy and has this destructive effect on the social order. Um, obviously, opium has an immensely destructive effect on the Chinese population, but not only opium, but he talks about the import of cotton and the way that the import of cotton had this devastating impact on the native industry across Asia. You know, says he says, you know, that spinners and weavers have suffered greatly under this foreign competition. We, we will see this again and again and again with the history of uh, colonization and globalization, the way in which the import of commodities from different parts of the world is going to have this devastating impact on native industries and the workers who work within these native industries, because this, this foreign competition will serve to undercut these native industries and throw workers, you know, out of a job and, you know, or throw them off their land or in, in some way or another, throw them into conditions of, of desperation. So these uh, effects of foreign competition um, continue to this day to have these kinds of, of devastating impacts. Um, so, you know, then speculating on the impact of the Taiping Rebellion in China for the British economy and the world market, Marx writes that a crisis may ensue if one of the great markets suddenly becomes contracted. So here again, we have this thing where capitalism is creating a, a, a world economy, a global economy, but now this global economy becomes vulnerable to what is happening, you know, in a place like China. So that if the demand within the Chinese market contracts, you know, it may reverberate and have this international impact that comes back and, and affects the global economy all the way back to Britain. So he's kind of anticipating what, again, what we have now, which is this interconnected nature of the global economy where something that happens in another part of the world comes back and, and has an effect, you know, in, in multiple regions in, in many places, uh, because things are more interconnected, it also makes the, the world economy more like vulnerable, more fragile, more prone to crisis. Marx writes that it would be a curious spectacle that of China sending disorder into the Western world, right? That what could happen in China, a, you know, which Marx said it had previously been isolated, if it could have this kind of uh, impact, uh, this kind of boomerang, you know, that goes back and, and sends disorder into the Western world. Um, he then, in this article, you know, goes on to observe the role that economic crises have played in the history of Europe, you know, going back to the French Revolution, um, you know, from 1790, uh, all the way to uh, the revolutions of 1848. It says basically like economic crises are like revolutionary dynamite. You know, they, they, they explode uh, the contradictions that, uh, you know, previously lay dormant within the society. So every revolution in Europe from 1790 to 1848, he says, has not been preceded by uh, a, a commercial and financial crisis. You know, the a commercial and financial crisis it has been the thing that, that sets off, you know, um, a, uh, an upheaval, uh, a popular mass rebellion. Um, as with India, Marx became increasingly critical of British colonization and, uh, you know, its, its dealings with, with China after 1853. Um, he had you know, 
less and less confidence in the progressive benefits of capitalism and colonization. And uh, he you know, came to chronicle the violence and atrocities committed by the British when he was writing about the Second Opium War in 1857. So again, the, the, the hypocrisy and the, the violence of colonization and uh, capitalist development and globalization moved more and more to the forefront of Marxist thinking um, as he saw, you know, out in the real world, the, the effects that it was having. And finally, we come to Ireland, you know, arguably the, the first, the, the original um, English colony going, you know, all the way back to the Norman invasion in the Middle Ages of, of 1169 that, uh, you know, partially you know, resulted in at least a, a partial conquest of the island and then marked the beginning of, of more than 800 years of English political and military involvement in Ireland. Um, the first full conquest of Ireland by the English and its um, mostly Protestant settlers would be in the period between you know, 1536 and 1691 and 16th and 17th centuries. So in a lot of ways, like because I, Ireland was like the original um, English colony, it served as a kind of a prototype, you know, that would be followed in so many other places around the world, you know, from India to China to, you know, the Caribbean to, you know, Africa and, you know, pretty much everywhere you can think of. Um, Ireland was, you know, kind of the prototype for colonization and, and in a lot of ways also the prototype for, for a kind of uh, racism that em emerged out of colonization, which is interesting to think about given, you know, the fact that, you know, the Irish, of course, are also a, a light skinned peoples and yet they were seen as a different race of people um as and not just different but inferior as a way of kind of legitimating of, of justifying of rationalizing this colonization the irish were you know dehumanized as an inferior race and that process of racist dehumanization would then be grafted onto other populations uh you know indigenous people in uh, North America or uh, Africans who were, you know, brought over as slaves into the Americas. These kinds of racism um, that had originally been established against the Irish would then uh, be applied and expanded and extended in all sorts of ways against other groups uh, around the world. Right? So it kind of laid the, the foundation of a, um, basically white supremacy uh, that, that we, you know, again, obviously have, have, have not gotten rid of uh, in the 21st century. Marx and Engels wrote that, you know, about, about Ireland and, and its colonization, you know, uh, from the time that they were young in the 1840s and and 50s, they, they're always very interested in this process. And Engels was, was especially um, concerned with the, the fate of the, the Irish. Um, but again, there's, there's a kind of a change in opinion that happens in response to real world events. Um, after 1867, Marx's views changed pretty significantly he became more and more firmly anti-colonialist um, in the same way that he did with respect to India and China. And the reason is, is again, like with India and China, he was responding to a real world upheaval by the colonized people. 
1867 was the year that, that the Irish struggle really came to a boil in the Fenian movement, which was a, a, a rebellion against British rule. You know, so again, like the Sepoy uprising in India, um, the Taiping Rebellion in China, these, these events caused a, a significant shift in Marx's thinking about colonization and its, you know, supposedly progressive benefits, its, its alleged benefits. Um, and we see this in a, in a letter that he writes to Engels in 1867, where Marx wrote, uh, I once believed the separation of Ireland from England to be impossible. I now regard it as inevitable. And then in the same letter, he says, I have sought every means at my disposal to incite the English workers to demonstrate it in favor of Fenianism. So he's, Marx, you know, here in this letter is, is acknowledging that, you know, he's, he's basically changed his mind about some stuff um, as a result of, of witnessing this upheaval, you know, this rebellion. Um, and he's become more and more critical of colonization and is, in his words, now working to try to convince, you know, the English working class that they have to, to have like solidarity with the Irish working class, even though like, you know, the, the English working class has been inculcated with all this kind of like racism, you know, to look down upon the Irish, to think of the Irish as this kind of, you know, inferior uh, race of people. And Marx is saying that, you know, he, he's trying at least to help English workers, you know, develop a kind of sense of international solidarity. Um, because as we'll see in the next slide, he really feels that, you know, race, he's starting to see that, that, that racism is, is the thing that's really undercutting the, the working class and, and undercutting its, its uh, capacity to have class consciousness and, and rebel against capitalist exploitation. So in 1870, uh, Marx writes to these two um, German immigrants in the United States uh, who were part of the, the International Workingmen's Association, which was uh, like an organization, um, you know, like it says to, to you know, that was international in its scope to, uh, you know, try to foment a kind of working class rebellion against capitalism. And he, so he writes to these two guys, Meyer and Volk, um, and uh, presents his, what he says is like his fullest, one of his fullest statements about his, his views about Ireland. So that's why I've, I've included that letter here as part of your um, assigned reading. He says, I I've come to the conclusion that the decisive blow against the English ruling classes cannot be struck in England, but only in Ireland. This is a pretty profound statement because Marx is saying basically that he had begun thinking that the struggles among workers in the colonized nations might touch off a revolution in the you know core industrial uh, nations uh, you know the, the the among the workers in the colonizer nations you know and and he had previously assumed that the revolution would have to start with workers in the most advanced capitalist societies he basically had assumed that the, the revolution would have to start with workers in places like uh, England, uh, France, uh, the United States, maybe Germany, right? the, the core industrial nations. But now in his letter, he's, you know, beginning to, again, suggest a, a kind of a change in, in his mind, where he, he thinks that, yeah, maybe the, the, the revolution will begin with, with these oppressed workers in, in the colonized nations in, in, in a place like Ireland, you know, so that national liberation struggle could be a spark uh, 
that could ignite uh, an international workers' revolution. And he's also beginning at this time to recognize the obstacle that racism is in the way that it's dividing the working class. He's talking about here how racism has divided the English and the Irish workers from each other, you know, how it's become an, you know, an obstruction uh, that prevents solidarity and class consciousness. He writes the ordinary English worker hates the Irish worker because he sees in him a competitor who lowers his standard of life. And this is, of course, the dynamic that is so characteristic of all kinds of racism and hatred of immigrants that we see uh, and continue to see in all different kinds of uh, parts of the world. You know, where the uh, worker from a colonized nation, an immigrant worker, a worker who's seen as part of an inferior race is hated by the worker from the supposedly superior race or the colonizer nation. And it has the effect of obstructing class consciousness and international solidarity. It's, it's like a divide and conquer kind of strategy that ultimately disempowers the whole working class and maintains the power of the bourgeoisie of the capitalist class. And he draws this actually pretty remarkable parallel with um, racism in the United States. He's saying by comparing himself with the Irish, the English worker sees himself as part of the ruling nation and thereby, therefore, becomes a tool of the aristocrats and the capitalists and thus strengthens their domination over himself. And here's then where he draws the parallel with how racism divides black and white workers in the U.S. He says basically this, the attitude that the English worker has towards the Irish worker is the same as the attitude that like poor white people or working class white people in the United States have towards black people in the, you know, former slave states of the U.S. And, uh, you know, like he uses the, the N word here, um, but puts it in quotes in order to kind of emphasize, you know, like he knows that like this is like a racist term that is used uh, by white, poor whites and, and white working class people um, in a context, you know, in a, in a like a hateful kind of context. So, so he, he uses that word, but, but recognizes its, its, its racist function. Um, and the, ultimately the effect is, is to divide these groups that are both exploited and, you know, have a lot in common with one another, except for the fact that, you know, the whites have been inculcated with this racist hatred. They've been taught, you know, they've been socialized into this kind of racist prejudice. <clears throat> and so um, the ultimate impact of this, you know, as he says, was that um, the, you know, the, the work, the more privileged workers, whether they're white, white workers in the United States or English workers, um, see themselves as part of the, the ruling nation. They identify more with the, the, the ruling class and uh, with um, the, the, the ruling nation. And in, in so far as they're, they're tricked by their racism, they become a tool of the ruling class. They're being used by the ruling class. And then um, that just kind of strengthens the domination of the ruling class over uh, the, the you know, white workers in the US and, and English workers. Um, 
and so it's it's ultimately kind of a, a divide and conquer kind of uh, strategy. Um, he says that kind of divide and conquer strategy that that racism is is stoked by all these institutions in society, by the press, you know, like the newspapers, the media, uh, by the church, by the popular culture. Um, all of this is is in his words the secret which enables the capitalist class to maintain its power. It's the way that the one percent is able to maintain its rule um, is by dividing the ranks of the ninety nine percent along the lines of uh, along the lines of race. So, in conclusion, you know what we see is how. Marx's viewpoint really kind of evolved uh, and changed in response to these real world events in India and China and Ireland um, and uh, gave him a more kind of critical perspective on colonialism and, and development um, in comparison with where he had started off in 1848 with in the Communist Manifesto. Um, in the next video lecture, when we look at uh, Marxist theories of imperialism uh, in the 20th century, uh, we'll see uh, again, like uh, a much more critical and much less ambivalent stance, uh, particularly with people like uh, Lenin and a number of other Marxist theorists who were uh, trying to understand the nature of imperialism in the early 20th century, um, we'll be focusing in that video lecture on, uh, on Lenin's text, uh, Imperialism or the Highest Stage of Capitalism. Um, but for now, that basically concludes um, our discussion of Marx, and uh, I will see you next time. Bye.